What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram at Talk Louder underscore podcast. And our website, TalkLouderPodcast.com, where you'll find links to our previous episodes and links for merch. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And uh, man, I'm really excited about today's show. I say that a lot, but uh, today we've got a guy who I wanted this guy's job. We've got Ricky Rackman on the show today. And Ricky, of course, is probably best known as the host of MTV's Headbangers Ball. I was fortunate the- enough, fortunate enough to visit him at work. Yeah, you Dangerous yeah. Toys was on uh, was on Headbangers Ball. That's right. You can yeah, find being, clips of that on YouTube. Inter- being interviewed by Ricky it was like my version after your intro. There was me. Hey, I got to visit him at work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you and, and then I would and then I would see him later that night. Yeah, you and Mark like, were hey, on. Was, uh, cool. You and Mark were on Headbangers Ball. With, I would with be Ricky. like, that was fun this morning, Ricky. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he's uh, obviously uh, done amazing things. He was the host of Headbangers Ball. He is the uh, co-owner of the Cat House Nightclub, the notorious Cat House uh, Nightclub in Hollywood. Uh, he co-owned it with Tammy Down, his best friend from Faster Pussycat. Uh, so he's done a lot of things that uh, I wish I could have done, to be quite honest. Um, And uh, he was kind enough to be on the show today because he is kicking off a, I'll call it a spoken word type tour, I guess, where he's going to, maybe a storytelling type tour is is more accurate. He's going out and doing some dates at some clubs uh, starting tonight or tomorrow night, depending on when this episode airs. But uh, he's basically going out and telling his stories to a live audience, standing on stage, holding a mic and telling, you know, a lot of great stories about coming up in the Hollywood rock scene, his days at the cat house, his days on uh, headbangers ball, uh, just his life in general. He's uh, he mentions with us today on the show that he was kind of a, an aspiring musician at one point that never really panned out. I mean, he's done a few bands and a couple gigs and things like that, but uh, there's quite a few people that have heard Ricky front of band sing singing. I've seen him sing in front of band and I'll let him tell <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Give you his opinion of his performances. And one of the things I admired about him is he is brutally honest. And I think that's what makes it. You I, know, when when he was on Headbangers Ball, a guy like me, that was that was church, man. That was you wow. did not miss that show because back in those days there was no internet, there was no Instagram, there wasn't this 24-7 news cycle, there was no blabbermouth. Um, if you wanted your heavy metal news, you tuned in to Headbangers Ball and watched Ricky Rackman. And what I liked about Ricky is he, he brought a certain amount of credibility to the job. You could tell he was down with the musicians. He was from the streets. He was from the scene. He really knew, you know, the, the, the ins and outs of the whole thing. But it I like how he, he confessed and said he didn't really know what he was doing. And then sometimes it would be a band that he, that he didn't know anything about. And it was scary for him. You yeah. Know? So, but that, I think that was part that. of the appeal is that he always came across as genuine, whether it was, either, whether he knew his, the, the, the material or the band or the homework or whatever, or not. What you, what you had to like was that it was coming from a place of honesty and it showed, and I think that's what made him so relatable. And uh, it felt like he was one of us, and he was getting the inside scoop from the bands that we all listened to and loved. So, uh, well, you, I feel like you guys uh, have a little bit of a kindred spirit by way that you know you're you're completely uh, you know drenched in rock and roll. Uh, you have attitude and love for the music first and foremost. You, you guys both uh, aspired to either play or write or perform or produce, you know, rock and roll music. Yeah. Didn't pan out. So you wanted to be as close to it as possible. So you figured out a way to uh, get busy uh, being part of the, uh, you know, the army. You couldn't be the quarterback, but it's okay if you were, you know, assistant coach or on the sidelines or, or even in just in the front row, making sure that you were writing down the set list they played so you could review it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was just this need to be connected to it. And uh, you just found a way to, to be connected to it. 
I did it. Ricky did it. Ricky did it on a much higher level than I did. But, but well, yes, that's not anybody, right. that's not anybody's fault. But yeah, he's uh, it. It's no it's no secret uh, as to as to why and how because he's just he's he's got energy. Yeah, and he can be hard to keep up with for sure. But I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Lots of great stories. A nonstop episode full of great stories. And, and it was a energy. good one. Today's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Our guest today, Ricky Rackman on the Talk Louder podcast. When you first, your first concept of having this badass place for you and your friends to go party, uh, basically, uh, did you think, <laughs> did you know that you were going to have bands play? And did you know what? No, that, no, you know, not, didn't even... basically, not basically, exactly. That's why it was, right. it was, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a cliche that's that I think Tammy said or something like we opened it to get free drinks and meet strippers. That's the only reason we did it. You know, right. all my <laughs> friends were starting bands at the time, like guns and roses, faster pussycat, you know, and, yeah. and I just kind of thought, let's just find this bar that we can all hang out at. And um, sorry for that chirping. It's, I have a parrot. No, it's fine. <laughs> and um, we like pets. And, uh, We've it, never it, had a parrot on the show before. That's huh? cool. <laughs> We've never had a parrot on the show. We've had yes, dogs. I get credit for one thing. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was always, I, I didn't think the cat house was going to be, I don't, I don't know how to put it, it has such a, a important part in rock and roll because you have to understand at that time, Guns N' Roses hadn't even released a record. So there's no way that we would have thought that our scene would have, you know, I mean, uh, Poison didn't even release a video at that point. So there's no way that I would know that our band, our club would have become such an important part in rock and roll history because Guns N' Roses hadn't even put out a record yet. You know, right. we none of our bands of that era had even started to do anything. The only bands that we knew were, you know, Motley Crue was already big. And, uh, you know, I knew them before the Cat House. But, you know, there, there was no way to ever imagine. And I think that's one of the reasons... <clears throat> That there's there's such a legacy of the cat house is because it really was open purely with the premise of just having fun and yeah. everything that I pretty much try to do is is set up with that basic it's it basis it's really hard for me to do something that's just pure business I I take fun stuff and find a way to make it a business well back yeah. to what I back to what I was saying was it your intention to have bands play and and, no, and eventually no. like budding bands as well as big badass name bands like brands. Um, Cat House was opened up purely, if you look at the first flyers for the first, you know, ooh, eight months, it was a rock and roll dance club. And it was only a DJ, okay. period. Only a DJ playing so, rock and roll. So I went to the Cat House as early as, I want to say, uh, 87. Now, which, yeah. now, was it in the same location you played or was it in a different location? Might have been the, the when did when did you open? I opened in September of 1986 okay. and we moved it in uh, 1987-ish or eight. And it, it, when it would started, it was just, it was just a, a rock and roll dance club. That was yeah. it. So and I then, went to, I think I went to the first one when you just had a DJ and I was in town uh, shopping some stuff to um, like, I think Metal Blade and I was there staying with uh, a friend of mine. And uh, there was an there was an old uh, acquaintance of mine that had moved from Houston to out there, and she picked me up, and we went to the cat house, and I actually danced at the cat house, the and, original cat I mean, house. The, the funny thing is that when when I opened the club, people weren't used to dancing at a club. Yeah, but Axel would walk out there on the dance floor, and he yeah. would just start dancing and dancing. Sure. And like girls would go and stand in front of him, and he would just turn around and dance. And it was just like that's that's how it was set up. It was just set up like that. What yeah, was it about? Um, what was it about Tammy that that connected you? That made you realize this guy's going to be the perfect business partner or our best friend, and we're going to make this work. What was it about his personality that clicked with you? Well, definitely best friend, best business partner. I wouldn't say that, <laughs> but um, Tammy and I met. Uh, I guess it would have been in 85 
And we just met at a party that, that I went to. And I think there were like three other people at that party and we just met and we just clicked and we just became friends. And he hadn't even played in Faster Pussycat yet. And I was a club DJ, DJing like traditional dance clubs. And I said, hey, come down to my club. Ice, I think, was the club that I was working at. Of course, it was called Ice. Of course. (laughs) And um, and he didn't he didn't dig it, which I understood. (laughs) But we still became friends. And then I said, dude, because Tammy worked at a store on Melrose called Retail Slut. And Tammy knew. I mean, there's something about Tammy that chicks dig him. I I I can't put my finger on it. Because um, because he's not like, hey, baby, he's not like swap. But dude, the old guy has always pulled chicks. And so I'm like, OK. Will you help me get like all the girls there? And I knew, you know, the strippers and the mud wrestlers and that. And you help me do that. And and all all did. It, and we just kind of worked together to create this like decadent thing. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then Faster Pussy Cat started playing shows. And then Faster Pussy Cat got a record deal. And it was probably only after the club had been open a year and a half mm. that um, I took over the whole thing. And it became Ricky Rackman's world famous cat house. Right. But Tammy and I, you know, for the past, I would say, maybe 10 years, the past 10 years, we're better friends now than we ever were back then. You know, I mean, now, I mean, to say that I talk to Tammy a couple times a week, Definitely. You know, we ride motorcycles across country together uh, to say I love him like a brother. I, I love him like a brother. He's, oh, he's yeah. my brother, you know. And um, but, you know, he was part of it and he helped create it. And then I just, you know, I, I got sober and then I became like obsessed with building this brand Cat House. Yeah. And- well, a lot of people. uh dreamed about going there who never got to go there so any sort of inception of it that you recreated as like a flashback or uh you know a trendsetter or or any kind of brand or tone or you know cat house whiskey whatever uh i think that i think that the people that kind of missed it are are like damn it well at least i can support now and wear the colors and keep this thing cat going. House coffee Love it. I want yeah, some. I'm, I'm drinking coffee right now. It's I've, I've, been, house. I've been, uh, me and my wife, we were, we went to Costa Rica and we've always been just coffee freaks. Hmm. And I was working with a coffee brand before when I was doing, I was working with Death Wish Coffee when I was doing my motorcycle rides. And I said like, you know what? I want to start my own coffee. And we started off really, really small using a specialty coffee because we're so into coffee. And I mean, we were going to the roasters, we were putting stickers on bags. And I was like, I was going to call it onslaught and i don't remember all the different names that i was going to call it and then i was like what if i just call it cat house coffee yeah. and then somebody offered me a licensing deal and i turned it down because even though i'd make a lot more money for a lot less work it wasn't good coffee so when right. i started cat house coffee with leah it was you know it's 100 percent arabica it's the, it's it's some of the best coffee and people buy it and uh and it's it's great, and it, I'm mar- and we barely even market it because we can only roast a hundred bags at a time. Where can so, people buy it right now? Cathousecoffee.com. Okay, nice. That, that, it's not in stores. Just like nothing, nothing yeah. that I make with Cathouse Apparel, which is always done well. Cathouse Apparel, you can't buy it in stores either. You can only get it at CathouseHollywood.com. Right. And, right. And even though, like I said, I could have, especially when the dirt came out. No, not the dirt. When Pam and Tommy came out. Um, the Tommy Lee character was wearing cat house stuff in the whole thing. Or when Axel, you know, still was or slash recently is wearing cat house stuff. I could have easily gotten a big ass check and they could have sold it at Hot Top. Sold. But you know what? After that big old, big fat ass check was cashed, nobody would buy it anymore. And yeah. instead, I get to come out with like really high end quality stuff every so often. And am I getting rich off it? No, but it's still fun to have. Like, you know, nobody is, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be. Ed Hardy, you know, I don't want it to be insert brand here. Owning your own brand and doing your own t-shirts is very punk rock DIY. Ramones always own their own. You know, there's something to be said about that. I'm very proud that, you know, everything that I make, you know, I have two offices and we have a staff and and they ship the stuff out and I'm, I'm there all the time. And, you know, all my, if you took everybody that works for me, it might be like three people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell, so the cat house, uh, and then we'll move on, but the cat house, uh, in, in became known as this notorious, uh, ground zero for everything decadent. And what's the most debauched thing you ever witnessed at the cat house? 
you can't really say what was the worst because was, was were people having sex in the bathroom? Absolutely. Were people having sex in other places? Yes. Um, that was one of the reasons that I said nobody can ever have, which I kind of regret it and don't regret it. I always said no photographers were ever allowed in the cat house mm. because I wanted people to feel like they could do whatever they want. You know, when my cashier says, oh, well, Robert plants at the bar and I go over to the bar to meet Robert Plant, he's got because he went there, grabbed a chick, disappeared. You know, it like everything happened. You know, it was. I think because it wasn't club promoters running the club, it was it was Tammy and myself that were partaking in the same things that everybody that went there was. Sure. And, and, the, and the, the reputation it got was, was notorious. Yeah. And I never publicized that. I let other people talk about it. If I would have said, Hey, everybody come to the sleaziest club in the world. <laughs> we have hot chicks at our club. It would have been like, shut up. You know, yeah. but, you're not, but, you're not Gazzari and you don't right. want I mean, not, ever right. Bill Gazzari. Yeah. You know, his commercials were I got the hottest, guys on my stage and the hottest chicks i was like whatever dude. i'm glad that worked for him <laughs> pretty cheesy though you know it was, it was but look at it you know yeah now i don't think sure. like i'm i am probably as old as bill gazari was back in that day which makes me really think like wow like that makes me feel old like i never well, thought about that no relation to his sort of i, I don't know i always just called it kind of gangster attire that he always had on uh, the, the thing is, is, uh, is, uh, you know, you, the cat house is kind of a speakeasy, you know, you know, photographers no it was kind of this, you know, but I feel like, do you, was it like, uh, a lot of the New York clubs, like where there's just a thousand people in line standing there all night, you know, waiting for someone to go, you're cool. You're cool. Fuck no, you. Fuck you. that was one of the reasons that was another reason that I opened the cat house because right. it's funny that you would mention that. Cause that was like exactly one of the reasons i opened it because i would dj regular clubs occasionally i would go to other clubs and they used to take these velvet ropes and put outside and some pompous prick with a clipboard would sit there and look and look who got in well i was never one of those people that ever got into clubs and that used to sicken me so we made sure we didn't do the velvet ropes we had a very small guest list and it was all friends and family. And I mean, I remember, I remember being at the club myself, standing in front. Some guy said, "There's some rocker dude that had all the gear on." He said, "Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have any money right now." And I'm like, "Did get in there?" You know, I, I mean, I mean, now I don't own the club, so I can tell people that I did that. But I remember right. keep being at the front door <laughs> and somebody going up and saying, "If I give you a hundred bucks, can I get in front of the line?" And Keith standing up and said, "This guy wants to give me a hundred bucks to get in front of the line. Should I give it to him?" And everyone's like, "No." And he's like, "Get in the back of the line." Like. We didn't give a fuck. Wow. But here's the story. Josh Richmond told a story about Brad Pitt calling, I think, Bridget Font. <laughs> this is such, such a crazy story. Whoa. Brad Pitt, before he was famous, being in line, calling Bridget Fonda to call Josh Richmond to say, hey, can you get me in front of this line? I mean, Brad Pitt wasn't famous. <laughs> but the truth is, we didn't care because, you know, I could, I, Millie Vanilli showed up at the, one of the, I don't know which guy it was, showed up at the cat house and said, hey, will you present us with cocaine and women? I'm like, fuck you. You know, I mean, it was, it was so crazy that people had that attitude in, in clubs in Los Angeles and New York. And that was what we didn't because, you know, the we it was open for us misfits, for us dirty rockers. That's the way it was open. So those people are more important to it's pretty me. Cool. It's pretty cool for you to be able to say those hoity-toity folk, they had the wrong idea. They had you all wrong, Ricky. They thought you were running some kind of like, oh, well, I'm so-and-so, you know, and you didn't care. I, yeah. I never gave it because mm -hmm. that's yeah. not me. I'm right. not one of those guys. Even, you know, I've never been one to talk about how much money I make, what I drive, where I live, what my life. Cause I'm, cause it doesn't matter. I, I've had so many highs and so many low, low lows, and I'm still pretty much the same guy. It's just all about the hustle, you know? Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I would much rather I feel more comfortable talking to the people that have regular jobs and are struggling because I've been there and sometimes I am still there. And those are the people I want in my club because those are the people that are going to have fun. The people that get picked in the velvet ropes, those people aren't having any fun anyway. Yeah. Well, I think that it's it's cool that it's you know, we should probably move on a little bit and maybe come back to it later. But I, I, I mentioned it a minute ago. I, I think it's cool that every once in a while, I mean, it might be five years, 10 years later, you'll have like. 
a cat house reunion concert or you'll do a thing sponsored by a cat house or da 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 and and that that just ooh that's cool man maybe some of the old gang will be there i think that it's well, it's cool that you kind of yes have and no you were a part of something that i thought that many people thought was great i I hated it with a passion. And that was when we did Cat House Live and you guys played. Irvine. Cat House Live was at Irvine Meadows. I don't know how many people there were there, but it did pretty good. And uh, I did it and it, I joined forces with Live Nation. Right. I hated it. I hated it so much because all of a sudden I had no say in what bands played. Hmm. All of a sudden, you know, they're telling me, it, okay, and this is not me talking bad about the band Extreme at all. I have nothing against Extreme. Couldn't be nicer, guys. Nuno is one of the greatest guitarists. However, Extreme is not a cat house band. Right. Okay. You were. You were. I wanted you on our bill. Yeah. But they tell me Extreme's playing. I'm like, Extreme's playing the cat house. And they're like, Extreme is headlining. I'm like, how is Extreme headlining? I put together an all star jam with Ace Freely, Sebastian Bach. Gilby, Evan from Biohazard, they're playing on stage and in the middle of the song, they start rotating the stage so they can get extreme on in time. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I mean, there were so many bands. This is a true story. I showed up and I wasn't on the list to get passes. I didn't even get the all, all access. There was so much of that that I really, really despised. So mm -hmm. what I did was I said, okay, I did the Cat House Live Festival. I appreciate Live Nation for giving me the chance to do that. It was me doing something with the corporate world. And the very next year, I'm going to do things my way. So I'm going to do the Cat House 30th anniversary. I rented out the Whiskey and I rented out the Roxy. I put tickets on sale and never told one person who was going to play. And the second the tickets went on sale, the Whiskey and Roxy sold out like that. It was the fastest sell on the Whiskey and Roxy, and nobody ever knew who was going to play until that night. Tammy had no idea. I said there's going to be a surprise act that nobody's going to expect. And this was at the Roxy show, and I didn't even tell Tammy. And um, I'm like, okay, everybody's expecting this. Everybody's just expecting Who's a band that nobody would ever think is going to play the cat house and the curtains dropped and it was twisted sister who had already broken up and didn't even do a reunion show. Twisted sister had played their very last show and the curtains opened and it was twisted sister of a whole band. And everybody's like, okay, because I wanted something that nobody would have ever expected. Right. He yeah. was so awesome for that. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and then the final night we did a tribute to Motorhead where we did all these crazy fun things. I, I did a duet with Shooter Jennings singing a Motorhead song. And, nice. and, and we just did all these crazy things. And it was a sellout both nights without anybody knowing who was playing. That means that those people trusted that I would deliver something good. And yeah. I believe I did. And that's the same thing with not to segue into my plugs. But with my with my storytelling shows that I'm about to go on tour with Tuesday, you know, people don't know what's going on. They don't know what this show is going to be. So because they're entrusting me with their hard earned 25 bucks, I'll be damned if I don't do my very best to have every single person sitting down watching my show to have the greatest time. Because let's be honest, I've been in this game for a long, long time. And the people that know me. You know, I got tons of haters. I got tons of haters. Those haters don't know me. They don't really know that much about me. But I've also got a very loyal group of people to support what I do. So I owe so much of them. So I will be damned if I let those people down. And, 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 and the fact that I'm still working in this business and I'm doing pretty good and I'm old is, is pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing because I know a lot of my peers that aren't. That's one of the things I think that um, <clears throat> your your name carries a certain amount of credibility. I think it it it, it uh, maybe in hindsight because nobody really was aware at the time, but uh, for everything you just said about the cat house, it was born from a place of sincerity. It's what you wanted to do on a street level kind of thing. Uh, when you were on Headbangers Ball, we finally had someone we could relate to, a guy that we trusted, a guy that was in the trenches, knew the personalities. He wasn't just a talking head. Um, and so in your, your tour, let's talk about that. It's the one foot in the gutter tour. Um, you've got five dates on the book so far. Um, what was the impetus for doing this? Um, and, and, and tell us some of the stories you're going to share for the first time as part of your act. Okay. I'm going to tell you one of the real, and I've never said this before. 
Exclusive. Yeah, this is an exclusive. And I don't, nice. if this gets me in trouble, I don't really care at this point. I had a venue that was a great venue in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I was going to do, um, what was it? A Night at the Cat House with Faster Pussycat and LA Guns and Junkyard and Jet Boy. I think that's what I wanted to do, right? And, and, and I wanted to have like dancing girls and videos and make it feel really decadent. Everything was set. And L.A. Gun, I, I'm going to say it. I don't care. L.A. Guns pulled some sh- L.A. Guns manager, agent, whatever it was, pulled a lot of lame stuff. And uh, and I got a, like I was still getting a big argument with Tracy about it. And and they just thought it was going to be the L.A. Gun show presented by Cat House. And I'm like, no, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this. And it just got really, really ugly because it was about it's like, this is what we do. for. I'm like, I just want to create something fun. I want it to be the Cat House. I didn't want to be a promoter of an L.A. Gun show. And they was like, well, Faster Push Cat's opening up. I'm like, it's the Cat House, you know. So I had this venue and it was this great venue. And I was like. I've always like I've always really appreciated what Henry Rollins does. Mm-hmm. And people have been asking me for a long time to write a book. Now, if I wrote the book, the book that I would write might not be exactly what people want. If they think it's going to be one of those books, like, first of all, the book, Nothing But a Good Time is a great book. I suggest people picking it up. There's a lot of great books about the 80s rock scene. But that's not what my book would have been. It would have been about what happened afterwards. It would have been, you know, what's it like going from half a million dollars to a year to six months later being flat broke and being a used car salesman. It would be about drugs. It'd be about getting arrested. It'd be the porn star girlfriends. It'd be all that stuff. That's what I wanted the book to be. And I was like, I have a really hard time sitting down and writing. I was like, what if I just told these stories? What if I got on stage and told these stories? How fun would it be? Because obviously I love to tell stories. I love to talk. Yeah, man. I was like, what if I got on stage and just started telling these stories? And then I sat down and and things started flowing. And then I said, okay, well, instead of just telling these stories, what if I made a part of the stage look like my room when I was a kid? And I started talking about the stories of vinyl that affected my life. And what if I showed video clips when... I was the top story in all the Los Angeles news channels for the wrong reasons. And what if I told, and then I started putting this thing together and I was like, I think I got something here. Yeah. So I did one show and uh, it was packed. And I'm telling you that when I walked on stage and started talking and I, even the five minutes before I went on stage, out of all the things I've done in my entire life and I've had some incredible jobs, before I walked on stage, it was the greatest feeling I ever had in my, better than anything Cat House or MTV or anything I've done. It was like, holy crap, like, like these people are here. And I, know, I hope this doesn't sound egotistical, but those people are not here to see Ricky Rackman introducing a band. These people are not here. Like, look, let's be honest. Nobody went to the Cat House to see Ricky Rackman. People went to the Cat House for this. When I'm on stage introducing a band, they're there to see the band. It was very weird. It's like the only reason these people are here right now is to hear my stories. And that was so flattering and so incredible. And, you know, when people buy a cat house shirt, they don't buy it because it's Ricky Rackman's club. Maybe they buy it now because the headbangers ball guy or whatever, but because they saw Tom Morello or John five or Axel or, or anybody wearing it, you know? So to know that people were at my show because they wanted to hear my stories, you know, Felt so good. And I went on stage and what was supposed to be two hours was three and a half hours long, which is too long. I don't want to do it three and a half hours again. <laughs> but the stories were so good. And, and and people saying like, dude, I was really inspired. I was like, wow, inspired? Because I tell a lot of very embarrassing stories. And I tell a lot of stories that people want to hear. People want to hear about Nirvana on Headbangers Ball and the Alice in Chains water park and the uh, the Axel and Vince feuds and the things that happen at the cat house. And people want to hear those stories. And I give all those stories. And there's a couple of stories about certain rock stars that when they find out that I'm telling those stories about them, they are not going to be happy with me at all. But I'm still telling these stories. And um, everything's true. And what I want this to feel like is that that we're hanging out at the bar and I'm just shooting the shit. Because, yeah. you know, I... I 
there's nothing worse than hanging out with somebody and you tell them a story and then they feel like they're going to one up you and tell you a story better. And I don't want to be that guy, but it's like every time somebody tells a story, it's like, Oh, well, I just, and I hate doing that because sometimes somebody will say something like, oh, you know, and then I got to see, I don't name a band. And then I was like, oh, really? Well, let me tell you about when they played the game. I don't want to be that guy, but I sometimes am just because I was in the right place the right time. Yeah. So tell us your, so, your, your press release mentions uh, a, a scenario where you sort of intervened between Axl Rose and David Bowie. What, what was that all about? I didn't really intervene because I didn't know what to do. Because um, what was going down? It was the, it was the, and I'll t that's a big part of the show. So I don't want to go into too many details. Okay. <laughs> but um, the night that at Guns N' Roses, I mean, Guns N' Roses were playing with the Rolling Stones in front of like 100,000 people. And Axel said, look, we want to play the day before at the Cat House. I was like, okay, legal capacity 600. Um, I'm like, okay, he goes, and we're going to, we're going to play two shows and we're going to shoot the It's So Easy video there. I'm like, and, but when Axel says he wants to do something, I'm like, whatever you want. And, um, and it was that night. And let's just say that David Bowie showed up that night and all of us love Bowie. I mean, our DJ Joseph was the biggest Bowie freak in the world. And let's just say Bowie was not the Bowie that we wanted that night. And mm -hmm. he was just a mess. And things transpired throughout that evening. What, 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 do you, what do you mean he was a mess? Was he just belligerent or was he out? Was yes. he yes. wasted or what? Yes. 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 <laughs> All of you. Yes. Above. <laughs> I want to get on stage with Guns N' Roses. Like think about that. Bowie on stage with Guns N' Roses. But we had to, we had to tell him no. Oh, wow. Right. And that didn't go over too well, huh? No, and then he did some other things that were very inappropriate, like trying to pick up on Axel's girlfriend and stuff like that. And it was just a, it was a mess. And so did, was, it, did it get to a point where there's a shouting match between the two? And, and got to the part where Axel's chasing David Boyd down the street saying he's going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why <laughs> we wanted you on the show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like, so to say I intervened, what do you do? When somebody says, oh, Axel is chasing David Bowie down the street saying he's going to kill him. What do you do? <laughs> you know what you do? I'll show you what you do. You just go like this. You go. Start selling tickets. I don't know. <laughs> you just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> What's another, can you preview another story that's part of your act uh, without, you know, I, I, of course, I don't want you to give away your whole, your shtick, but can you mention um, names? It's, it's or... a lot of stuff about what it was like really growing up in that scene. I mean, I grew up in Hollywood, you know, I used to deliver scripts on a moped on the Sunset Strip, wow. you know, um, and, you know, started, I started off in going to punk rock shows, you know, I started off, I, my background wasn't really, with the exception of Motorhead, because Motorhead was a part of my life always, because Motorhead, when I was a kid, I heard that first album and I thought it was punk rock. And then when I saw him on the young ones, I'm like, that punk rock singer's got long hair. It doesn't look like a, long, a, a punk rock band. You, you but, mean Ace of Spades? Yeah. Which yeah. is like their fourth or fifth record. No, 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 no. No, I had the first record. The first record, okay. Motorhead, was yeah. punk rock, which had on the song parole, Motorhead, which had the song Vibrator, yeah, which yeah. had the song. Yeah. But, but then later, I the saw them on the young ones. And yeah. on the young ones... They were playing the song Ace of Spades. So yeah. when I saw Motorhead playing live, because before I had just heard the songs and I really loved the songs. But then when I had seen them play lots, please see them playing. And I'm like, Lemmy's got long hair and he's wearing glasses. So it was the first album that I was exposed to that had the song Motorhead. When you hear that song Motorhead, yeah. which is the first time, that's punk rock. Motorhead. Da -da 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 -da, Motorhead. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> it's actually a Hawkwind song. What the Motorhead was, and I oh. liked Hawkwind too. Like, yeah. uh, what was the song? Silver Machine. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that's a great song. Yeah. That's a great song, and um, and but that was the first band that I mean. Before I was into punk rock, I was into Ted Nugent. I was into Alice Cooper. I was into all those. It was a big Deep Purple fan, um, ACDC, Aerosmith, all that stuff. Yeah. Then I went in 1979, I went into my punk rock direction and then came back to um, 
rock and roll. And so I talk a little bit about that and talk about certain things that happened to me with the kid. You know, my father w- w- was managing bands. So I had occasionally I had access to certain things as a kid. And what is it, what's it like when, you know, your all your friends are becoming the biggest rock stars in the world. And what, you know, my first start before I ever, before I ever uh, opened the cat house was I was, I told you I was a DJ and I was the DJ for Tommy Lee and Heather Locklear's wedding. Wow. You know, there was all these incredible things that I was a part of, you know, people talk about the big, you know, there was such a very well publicized feud between Vince Neil and Axl Rose. The yeah. entire feud started by something that happened this close to me. It all started right here. You know, and so I saw the whole thing happen and and being friends with both camps was very weird to me because I I still owe so much of everything I have to the band Guns N' Roses because they've helped me to this day, you know, so. Were were you ever, uh, would it be fair to say uh, that you were a frustrated musician? Were you ever uh, a guy that wanted to be in the band? (laughs) Well, that's like like this. Go ahead. Let me interrupt here. I've seen Ricky's band play. Don't say the name of your band, Ricky. Uh, I know it. Struggling with the year, probably 88. Um, at the country club on Rosita. On Rosita Boulevard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Dave, do you know the name of the band? I'm going to say Pygmy Love Circus. Nope. No. 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 Nope. Then I'm going to say the drunk fucks. Nope. No. 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 Nope. Ricky knows that I, Ricky knows I still have the flyer. You what do? Yeah. I have, I have the you flyer the somewhere. Motorcycle? Yes. Yes. What is it? Yes. What's the band? The band was called, drum roll please, Virgin. Ah, man. I would have never got <clears throat> Virgin. That. Yeah. Virgin. I, saw Rick, I saw Ricky pl- sing rock and roll live. Well, Virgin, I do talk about Virgin in the show because I play footage you of should. Virgin playing and me singing um, Jailbreak and Public Enemy Number 1 with Vince Neil. Nice. At the Whiskey. But in 94, I started a band called Battery Club, That's which was a punk rock okay. band. Okay. And Battery Club actually toured a little bit. Battery Club, I tried to... When I was in Battery Club, because we had like a guy from Social Distortion and we had all these guys and Battery Club, I tried to play shows and not tell everybody that it was um, Ricky Rackman from Headbangers Ball in the band. Because sure. I was still on Headbangers Ball. I could have easily said, hey, Ricky Rackman from Headbangers Ball's band is on tour. But I tried to make it seem like it was this punk rock band. So we were opening up for a lot of other bands. And Battery Club was a really fun band. Awesome. But you didn't do anything. But I mentioned what you what you alluded to. I mentioned in my show, every time I have ever seen any band play up until when I saw Wasp a couple days ago, I have always wanted to be the singer in the band. I have always wanted to be the singer in the band. Every show I've gone to, whether it was seeing Guns N' Roses or a Monomarth, I've always dreamt about being the singer in a band. So absolutely, I was the guy that while I mean, Virgin did okay. We weren't very good. And I'm sure I was the weakest link. But you guys had the guitar player with like the platinum blonde hair, right? Jim Torgerson. Big yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Jim. He was like a, like a big blonde Viking guy on guitar. Yeah. Yes, we had yeah. Jim Torgerson. Yeah. And, uh, and which is interesting because he was in a band. I believe the band that he was in was called China. And uh, they were sort of more gothy metalish. And when that band broke up and he was looking for a singer, from what I'm told, I don't know if this is true, but from what I'm told, Bobby Dahl from Poison said, why don't you see it? Since you're like into the gothy punk metal thing, why don't you talk to Ricky Rackman from the Cat House? All right. I think that's how the band started. We played shows, but... um, you know, I've played a couple of songs for my wife and she's like, oh, you guys were great. I think we were kind of cheesy, but <laughs> <laughs> and I never knew how to move. I never knew how to move on stage. And I, I talk about that in my show as well. 
So, well, what is it like then for okay. you? What is it like then for you? You you've got some some aspirations of wanting to be a singer in a band, and then Tammy comes home with the the debut Faster Pussycat record. Your friends and Guns and Roses are blowing up. The whole scene is blowing up around you. Everybody's on MTV and the radio, and they're going on world tours. What's it like for you being in the middle of that whirlwind, watching all your buddies go on and become you know they're on the covers of all the magazines and they're just everywhere. That's why I worked my ass off building the cat house as big as I possibly could, because while everybody else had bands, I had the cat house. Mm. So I had Ricky Rackman's world famous cat house t-shirts and I promoted the cat house as, as much as I could just because everybody else was like, wow, look, everybody else is a rock star. So I had the cat house. That was my, and I was Ricky Rackman from the cat house. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, I still like, I played, I got up on stage a couple years ago with a bunch of different guys from way from hate breed. And I've, I've played, I've probably been on stage about 20 times with Ace Von Johnson. Um, I, I mean, we, we still talk about playing music together because I think the world of him and, and we come from the same musical backgrounds. So I still get up on stage and play music whenever somebody will ask. Didn't you just yeah. send him a carcass t-shirt? I did. Yeah. I I saw that. He, yes. he posted yes. uh he posted that like yesterday or this Ace week or something. Loves carcass. <laughs> That's badass. And um I went to go see Carcass Obituary in Amana Marth. And uh how fun always, was that? Huh? How fun was that? Dude, have you seen Amana Marth? <laughs> I haven't seen him yet, but uh I'm in a band with a bunch of guys that go see him every time they, they can and they said it's just sick. There's, if you go see Amon Amarth, there's two ways you can go to see Amon Amarth, okay? Mm-hmm. You can go to Amon Amarth and you can be an adult and you can <laughs> say, this Viking stuff is cheesy as fuck. Or you can remember what it was like the first time you saw Bruce Dickinson fighting Eddie or the first time you saw Alice Cooper and Snake. Yeah. And you can go there and have fun. Let me tell you something. I will fly to go see him on a Marth again. It was one of the most fun shows I have seen in the longest time. Dude, they get the audience to sit on the ground and row a Viking ship. Okay. <laughs> they have hammers. And then I'm listening to their music and I love Amon Amar's music and I'm listening to it all the time. And then my wife picks me up in the car and she's listening to Amon Amar. And I was looking at her like, like I'm that notorious guy that, that leaves shows early and it's like the last song. And she's like, fine, fine. It's like, if you go there and you decide that you want to have fun, if you don't have fun in an Amon Amar, so you suck. Yeah. Cause Amon was so <laughs> much fun. And that's what I'm about. Like, like if I go to a show and I still go to a lot of shows, if I go to a show, I am there purely to have fun and not be that cynic that sits with his arms crossed and like, oh, well, you know, maybe they sounded better when they had their original this or that. I'm there to have fun, you know, yeah. and I'm not going to sit there and and, and look well, for things I don't like. T- tickets are too expensive for for music and i understand why and we we won't talk about that but but i'm telling you this they're too expensive to just be a wallflower and stand in the back besides the lights are not on those got those assholes in the back the lights are on the band and the crowd and the people who are having fun at every show they're not That's on it. those assholes on the back wall I'm all about going to shows. I'm all about having fun and I'm old and fragile. I stay away from the pit, but, um, but I'm all about having fun. And I mean, I will fly to see shows when I can, uh, you know, when, and, and, and I'm all about the experience. I'm, uh, I'm probably more about the experience now than I was back when I was a kid, but cause I remember seeing, I mean, I remember seeing Tommy Lee's drum set and just being like, Oh my God, this is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. And, and, and I want to still have that be that. And I think, I think that's what keeps me on. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good I, to see that your energy has not changed since uh, since we met so so yeah. long ago. I don't know. I want to have fun. I go see bands, and if if they're, if they're too serious, and if they're just doing the obvious money grab and going through the motions, I'm like, you know, if you guys were playing, I'd go see you by me because you're a fun band. You know, oh, I haven't seen your new bands though. 
Well, that's okay. So, so listen, you may, that's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, so you said a second ago, and I, I think you've said it a couple of times, not, not, not too many times, but enough for, for me to recall. Uh, it's all about the hustle. You like, I don't know what year this was, but I recall you being a KNAC DJ when they were, were still on air and not a digital station. Wow. I recall, I recall you, you know, being in bands, I recall, you know, of course, the obvious things um, were you let me ask you this. Did you were you making some kind of like reasonable paycheck when you were DJing for KNAC? It was OK. For KNAC? Yeah. No. OK, that's no. that's why no. that's why I brought it no. up, because I thought I, about had, that. I was like, I this is, still, this is I he's in between things here or he's doing the favor or he knows no. that. I mean, I started a radio that. show called Radio Cat House on KNEC. That's it was right. One night a week and had the highest rating the KNEC ever got. Wow. And I did it because I wanted to do it. Listen, there's other jobs. Like I, I for the past couple of years, I've been on Fox Sports working for the American Flat Track Motorcycle Racing Series because okay. I love flat track. I love the sport. So I'm out there and I'm out there with a the mic and I'm out there at the dirt tracks across America. And if you think I'm getting the big bucks for that, you're completely wrong. I'm doing it because I love it. I nice. mean, there's jobs. You know, I've had I had a nationally syndicated radio show where I did nothing but talk about NASCAR and play rock and roll because I've been such a NASCAR freak for decades. Wow. And I've got to make money at that. But if you've got your hands in a lot of things and all the things are doing OK, you know, then you're doing all right. I mean, yeah. uh, I have no idea what 2023 is going to do. I mean, do I think that going out on tour and doing these spoken word shows are going to get me rich? I can tell you straight out. I started this five show tour with tour bus dreams because I wondered what it'd be like for on a tour bus. And then I decided, no, I'm going to actually have to do it in a transit van. And now I've got a minivan in my driveway that's loaded up with stuff. My tour manager is my wife. I know another couple that's going to help me do merch. And one guy's going to help me with the videos. And we're staying in crappy hotels along the way. And I'm like, this is really cool. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, awesome. I've, I've, I've always been working. I've, you know, there, you know, people don't know how long I've been working in motorsports or, or how, or about my coffee company or apparel company or all these other things that I'm doing. It's just because I'm always working because there was a time in 2000 that I was broke, that I had zero money and I lost everything. And that was tough. And I don't want to go back there again. But if I do and I have to get a regular job, I'll get a regular job. You know, six years after Headbangers Ball, I was a car salesman right. because I wanted to work. I wanted to have a job. So somebody, oh, has been, you had this in your car. Most people have regular jobs. Most people in America have regular jobs. If you did something great at one point and then you've got a regular job, that means you're a loser when you when the people that are saying that are the people that have had regular jobs their whole lives and never did anything great i have you know i if i have to get a regular job then i get a regular job it's okay, okay. you know yeah yeah I, I i don't i don't care you know i will just always always work sure. let's talk about headbangers ball um and by the way i like your perspective on that uh yeah, it, i love it it is really cool to the people that have never done anything special or great or whatever will just never be able to relate. You, you know, they're kind of on this flat line. Popular and guy, fine and good. popular yeah. guy, not popular guy all of a sudden. And That's fine. Right. For, right. That, it's yeah. really hard. It's hard when all of a sudden, you know, a band is playing and I'm like, wow, they used to call me to put me on. Now I got to figure out, Oh, I guess I got to buy a ticket. Okay. I bought a ticket. Oh, Ricky Rackman, you're sitting in the far back. Oh, Hey, Hey, Ricky Rackman, things aren't going so good. Look, you're sitting next to me right now. I'm like, dude, you wow. you're sitting? yes, I'm sitting next to you right now. So things are, it's like, you know, right. Tell me about headbangers ball because, um, first of all, I'm just going to say you're, you're like one of my heroes because I'm kind of the frustrated musician who never was in a band. So I went into journalism and I wanted to interview rock stars and um, I, I wanted to be around the scene, but I was never the guy on stage. So you've done everything I wanted to do, whether it was open the cat house or host a uh, headbangers ball and headbangers ball at the time, people, you got to put this in perspective. There was a day, believe it or not, when there was no internet, there was no Twitter, there was no Instagram. 
And uh, if you wanted hard rock or metal news, you tuned in to MTV's Headbangers Ball. And Ricky was the guy, in my opinion, that finally brought some credibility to the show. And like I said, when you're watching the show, you know that he's he he doesn't even have to do his homework because it's all it's all right here. Yeah, let me interrupt. Kurt Loder, I, I, I'm fine with Kurt Loder, but Kurt Loder didn't have the dirt from the floor of the cat house in his boot right. claw. You know, right, right. And so I remember, I remember, I remember a time when Adam Curry was the host of Headbangers Ball. And I used to watch it because it was the only thing of its kind available on television. I'm a music nerd. And I remember one time I want to say it, I want to say it was Scott Ian from Anthrax was on the show and he pointed out Adam's wearing like a, a leather jacket with all these pins on it. And I think Ian says something about a Halloween pin that's on Adam Curry's jacket. And I think Adam said something to the effect of, I'm not even sure who this is. You'd have to ask wardrobe. <laughs> And I, I, at least I, he, at least he was truthful. He, he was honest. Okay. Adam was, Adam was fine. Adam, yeah. Adam never made any bones about it. Adam never. I mean, the thing about Adam Curry is he never said he was something that he wasn't. No, he never said I'm the hardcore man. He knows he no. was, you know, he right. was and, and that's that's kind of my point. I think the network maybe saw a, a need for a show of that's kind. And he was just sort of nominated for the job. Well, and everybody, like, ho everybody hosted Headbangers Ball. Right. I mean, downtown Julie Brown hosted Headbangers yeah. Ball at one point. Kevin Seal, every, they just kept on putting DJs. But the, the thing about it is, is I was not a journalist. I had never been on TV. I had never interviewed anybody. I was honestly the guy that had the cat house. That was it. So you, when you they, were perfect for the job, like we're trying to say. Well, thank you very much. But I look at those early shows and I'm like, oh, God, I yeah. Just, after a while, I started doing talk radio, and I think my interviewing skills definitely improved. But for the starting, I was asking the questions that everybody else asked. You know, as it got later, and you see me with Chris Cornell bowling or at a water park with Allison Chains, you know, then, or skydiving with Dave Mustaine, then I'm doing stuff that is is in my wheelhouse because I'm just having conversations. Right. But before, it's like I did not know how to how to be that guy when it's scripted, and, Ricky. You're it's so stale and you you seem nervous and you're you're kind of stuttery and everything. I'm I'm not saying you, it's me, it's Dave, it's anyone who's ever done this kind of stuff. And we all get I mean, me and Dave have gotten better at this. Our main thing here on the Talk Ladder podcast is we get excited and we start interrupting each other. Or I'm probably worse at it than Dave is. <laughs> but that's okay. I, and I what feel like when you're winging it, when you're just hanging out and at, and being just being a dude. I think that your interviews are stellar. It's just, you just go with it and hang out with whoever you're hanging out with. And it's easy. I mean, the truth is, you know, there's people that are really good at interviewing that ask all the right questions. I, if, I don't ask anybody who their producer is. Cause I'm not even really sure what the producer does. You know, I, what, what, what I hope I do. And I, I think I did this same thing. It's hilarious. In, I think I did the same thing in rock and roll that I also did do in motorsports today is I'm about personalities because I believe if you see, I mean, you know, the, the stuff goofing around with Lemmy and even the stuff with Mustaine that everybody thinks, oh, Dave Mustaine hated you. Yeah, if Dave Mustaine hated me, why was he on the show all the time? Why was he always playing the cat house? Why was I at his wedding? Why was all these things? It's like Dave Mustaine gave me a hard time because he wanted me to succeed. And if Dave Mustaine wasn't the way he was to me, I wouldn't have realized, okay, Ricky, you know, man up those are, I can't wait. if there was somebody i hated they wouldn't have been on headbangers ball i couldn't wait for dave Mustaine to get on headbangers ball because he pushed my buttons and the truth is nobody has ever gone up to me and said dude i love that interview you did with lars they never say that stuff they were all fun the stuff with metallica was great but they all remember this oh yeah dave Mustaine hated you well he didn't hate me but the fact that you remember that this many years later that's much better if you think that glenn danzig actually tried to throw me in a fireplace <laughs> okay because you know what people remembered that show and that's what i want i want people to remember the show that's yeah. what my whole goal is did you ever have anyone on on headbangers ball that 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 had like ridiculous demands or or things before they would appear on the show uh you know like rider demands or if they were i didn't know about it 
I didn't know about any, any, I wouldn't know what bands would like, because that would not be a thing. I mean, many times if a band was on Headbangers Ball, what I would do is like go there and talk to the band for a little bit before we go on stage. I mean, there's certain bands. The truth is, you know, I didn't do research for bands. And there are bands that were on Headbangers Ball that I was not into, that I'm into now that I was like, oh my God, like, like I like, like I was not a big fan of Creator back then. I'm the first one to say it, you know, but lately I've been listening to Creator a lot. And then I'm like, oh my God, there's an interview with me and the guy from Creator. And it's a horrible interview because I didn't know anything about the band. And I could see if you were a Creator fan, and believe me, their bands are very vocal, you know, that you would say like, oh, Ricky Rackman sucks. He didn't know anything about the band. And that was because I didn't know anything about the band. There was a lot of bands that, you know, that I wish I had had done a little bit more research or known a little bit about. But, you know, when I did Headbangers Ball, I'm just this young kid and I'm out there doing the cat house and I'm out there having that fun stuff and I'm not reading band bios or or researching all that stuff. I'm like, oh, what band is next? Oh, this band, oh, okay. Hey, you know, and it, instead yeah. of learning more, I, I, sometimes I wish I did learn a little bit more about the bands, but, um, you know, I, I was also lucky because most of the bands that were on Headbangers Ball had one at one point been to my club. So yeah. we had that, you know, that with us. And and a lot of times some of the bands that were, you know, good, that, that wanted to play the Cat House because they hoped they would be on Headbangers Ball. So, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, well, that to, to, I'm not saying this to try to make you feel better, but I feel like the story you just told about the creator interview and how you say it's a horrible interview. Um the the lucky thing the lu lucky for me when Dave has a guest on this show and I don't know shit about him I'm just going mm, mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm <laughs> and Dave's just kind of but by the end of the interview I'm playing in and I've got questions and by the end of the interview I'm just go wow that was interesting tell us about when you blah 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 right uh very little research from my side and it goes both ways you know Dave will come in and I'll have a guest and I'll do most of the talking and. So it kind of goes both ways, but what's cool is whether you think you tanked an interview with, with a band or two here or there on Headbangers Ball, it's okay. I think people at home were just glad that one, a band like Creator was on a, a yes. international network yeah. rock show about hard rock and roll and metal. And it's okay that there's you, a street punk in there hanging out with them going, what's up? You guys on tour? What do you sound like? Don't yeah. do shit. It's fine. People have like it's so fun. Like the whole hater mentality is so fun. Mentality is so funny because like I'll read people and say like, "Oh yeah, Headbangers Ball." And when you used to play like Nelson, which Nelson was never on Headbangers Ball. It's like, oh, when you used to play like it was all these hair soft bands, and I, and I'm like listening, and I'm like, yes, we did play a Warren and a Winger and a Poison, but we also played carcass and we also played you know obituary or, or whatever there was yeah. a lot of bands you know we also had the bad brains on headbangers yeah. ball we yeah. had the chromags on headbangers ball you yeah. know people people got to understand that the job of headbangers ball was to play all this hard rock heavy metal you know whether it was death metal or whether it was you know the glammy type stuff our goal was to play all of it so many times i myself criticized headbangers ball I'm like why are we playing this horrible song when we should be playing more heavy stuff. But the truth is we had to cater to everybody. And I, I, I think that Headbangers Ball shouldn't have played anything that was played on during the day. If we were right. playing Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue, prime time, don't play it on Headbangers Ball. Right. Yeah. You know? And yeah. the same thing goes with Alice in Chains or any of those other, other bands. But I, I wanted Headbangers Ball to be the place that you went to see the videos that weren't played during the day. I mean, yeah. there were Megadeth videos that were being played during the day. If a Megadeth video is being played during the day, play a different Megadeth video. Sure. But, yeah. um, but you know, I think it, the show gets criticized sometimes for things that aren't necessarily fair. And did and, you did you did you have any say in that? It's like, man, you guys played Home Sweet Home five times at by noon today. We're not going to play. You didn't. You didn't I know never that. got to pick one. I never picked one. And, and I've, I've told the story a million times on my birthday. I said, can we play something from Motorhead? And they played 
like Ace of Spades or Killed by Death or something they probably would have played anyway. I never got to pick a video and I never got to say if there was a band I didn't like. I could say if there was a band, which sometimes I get criticized for, it's like, yeah, Ricky, always, always saying Dan Zig and Suicidal Tendencies and this band's all his favorite band. Well, I would say like, hey, I really like this band because if there was a band I didn't like, I couldn't say anything. So if all of a sudden I'm here ranting about Danzig, it's because, oh, good, there's a band that I like. I can talk about this band because I really do like this band. Yeah. That sounds fair. It doesn't sound like you you had too many hard decisions to make about whether you like the band or not. You were you were also trying to provide a service and do a job and have fun doing it. That's I mean, that's like I said earlier. It's like it was just it was just, you know, and, and I, I do say this in my show. I wish I would have appreciated what I had. I mean, if you really break it down. I had the greatest job in the whole world. I yeah. mean, think about, think about yeah. the responsibility. I didn't realize that until like later that I kind of had the greatest job in the world. It's like, okay, Ricky, um, next week you're going to fly to England and you're going to be hanging out with Queensryche. Okay. Um, th then can you go to Japan to do stuff with Michael Monroe? Okay. Then hey, mm -hmm. go to Aerosmith, the Monsters of Rock Festival. And then I'm like, um, oh, I'm <laughs> hanging out with Rob Halford and Steven Tyler. And now I'm talking to Brian Johnson. I'm like, huh? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about when I say you had the job that I wanted. Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> but but I wish I appreciated how great it was. You know, it's a weird thing when all of a sudden everybody knows who you are. Like, and I, I remember, you know, everybody in Hollywood knew me because I was Ricky from the cat house. But when I'm walking and I remember vividly walking through the airport and somebody saying Ricky Rackman. And when I hear somebody call my name, the first thing I think is. Oh, it's one of my, so I'm looking like, oh, where are you? Hey, hey. Where? And it was like, hey. And I was like, well, that person doesn't know me. You know, it was odd to realize like there's people that know my name. And that it was at that point that I also realized that my name was not, this sounds weird. My name wasn't really my name anymore. My name was kind of a brand or mm -hmm. a product yeah. that when people hear the name Ricky Rackman, some really like it, some really hate it. But it's not just like, oh, my friend or that guy I know, Ricky Rackman. It's like all of a sudden, Ricky Rackman is a, a brand. Yeah. Whether you like the brand or don't like the brand. And that's kind of weird when that transition happens that all of a sudden, you know, you're you're kind of a product. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, if your name causes a reaction, I mean, it's it's to be expected. You're in the public eye. So your name is going to cause a reaction, just like Jason's name is going to cause a reaction, mm -hmm. you know. Um did you what what guest was the most fun off camera on Headbangers Ball? The guest that was the most fun off camera was the most fun on camera. Everybody knows the best band, the best get best band to ever be on Headbangers Ball and the band that that has the most popular shows was always Alice in Chains. Oh mm. wow. I mean, those shows, of course, I love Lemmy. Yeah. And of course, Lemmy was always fun on camera. Lemmy was always fun off camera. Lemmy has always been a very important part of my life from my barbecues at my house to always being there and helping with everything that I ever did um, to the point that my shows, I mean, what the guy that I turn to now to help me with my spoken word shows is Todd Singerman, who's Motorhead's manager. Right. Wow. You know? yeah. um, so that's a band that's always been a very important part of my life. And many times like, like I've seen interviews that I did with Duff that are just terrible. Because when I'm, you know, these are people that I'm hanging out with all the time. Then we get on camera and it's weird. And even stuff with like, I remember um, Steve Jones, who most people know from the Sex Pistols, but Steve Jones also was a rock and roll guy. And yeah. he had a record and he was on Headbangers Ball with me before I was even the host. I was like a man on the street. And the Steve Jones thing was just terrible. Even though this is a guy that I talk to all the time, all of a sudden it's kind of weird. And um, a lot of people were like that, but Alice in Chains were always great. Pantera were always great because Pantera was a band that I talked to off camera. And Pantera was a band that was really like the rock and roll band for the fans. Like, you know, you really couldn't say that Dimebag and Vinny and Phil and all, Agrex, all of them were that much different than the people that were at their shows, you know? Right, yeah. I mean, right. those were the bands that I, that I really thought were, were, were great on camera and off camera. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we said we were going to keep you for an hour and I'll keep going if you're willing to hang with us. I got one more minutes. 
Okay. All, all I have to do is I leave for my, my tour in a couple of days and I need to write my show. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's about a big one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, tell me, uh, I wanted to know if you have any Izzy Stradlin stories. I do. Okay. No, because he's obviously a... a recluse, but if anyone was in the scene and was close enough to have some Izzy stories, it might be you. So share one if you would. Well, Izzy, I met way before I met Tammy or anybody. Mm. Izzy used to go out with this girl named Angela that ended up, I think, marrying Andy McCoy from Hanoi Rocks. And I was, Imagine that. I was DJing. <laughs> yeah. I was DJing this club in the Valley, and I was a club DJ. Meant that I played dance music. I played George Clinton. I played Duran Duran. I played Frankie Goes to Hollywood, whatever. And that's what I did for a living. I used to drink and sit in the DJ booth. And I remember being in the DJ booth and Angela coming up and saying, Hey, can my boyfriend hang out with you? Cause you guys like the same kind of music. I'm like, okay. So Izzy came up and Izzy hung out in the DJ booth with me and we just played. And he was just starting Hollywood Rose. I think, I think it was Hollywood Rose or whatever it was. And, um, and me and Izzy became friends just through that before there was even guns and roses. And then later in life, um, when I was drinking a lot, Izzy and I, would I, I went to I went to, I remember this I went with Izzy to go see Rat play, and the and the opening band and I told Izzy I said see this band I go the singer is going to be as big as George Michael's and uh, and the singer was and it was Bon Jovi. Oh, wow. <laughs> I saw Bon Jovi open for Rat, and then Izzy and I I remember Izzy and I went to this strip bar, and um, it was a strip bar that had women dancing for women. And it was a gay women strip bar. And because I was the guy that owned the cat house, I could go wherever I wanted. So I remember me and Izzy sitting in this bar and we used to hang out at this bar and we were the only guys there, but the women would talk to you because they had no interest in you whatsoever. (laughs) But I remember going to that bar and liking it and then talking to the owner and I ended up opening up my second club there, Bordello. And that's where I ended up having the club Bordello, which was another club that I ran that was really fun. And uh, so, you know, have I talked to Izzy in the, since he left Guns N' Roses? No, but I've heard his solo records and they're great. And uh, I saw Izzy when they, I didn't talk to him, but I saw him when they, he got up on stage with the, the, the Chinese democracy Guns N' Roses. And I just felt like, like he was lost up there and it really bummed me out because I think Izzy's so cool, you know, yeah. I, and I, I haven't heard from Izzy and I wish I had because I like him a lot and his solo stuff and, and what he's done is, is, is really, really good. But yeah, Izzy's, Izzy's great. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to pick your brain because he's one of those people that uh, nobody seems to know much about. And uh, anyone that's got any inside information is always, you know, I always want to hear it because I'm, I'm a big Izzy fan. A lot of people are just for all the reasons you just said. So um, tell us about, let me, uh, you, you talked about Lemmy. Um, what about, uh, I'm just going to drop a couple names and you just tell me a story about them or a memory about them. Uh, Sebastian Bach. <laughs> okay, so so I was okay. That's what I'll do. I'll, I'll tell you stories that I'm not going to tell in my spoken word. Okay, okay? fair so enough. By the way, if anybody wants to go to my show, uh, Cleveland, Columbus, Buffalo, Sellersville, Pennsylvania, and Flint, Michigan, just go to cathousehollywood.com to get tickets. Perfect. Okay. So there you go. There and you go. Really going to be fun. So the last one of the last times I saw Sebastian, I was at a, at a UFC party in Hollywood and I was sitting down and there was this guy and I wish I could remember what band he sang for, but um, this is the, the reason I'll tell this story and not a story about Sebastian that I might tell in my show is because I think this is a hilarious story is uh, this was probably maybe three years ago. And, uh, and there was this guy that's like the singer in this band. And he was just really obnoxious and he was going up and he was like, like kicking people in the back or doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden he said something to Sebastian and I don't remember what it was, but it was at that moment that I realized 
Sebastian's big. Like you know, all the time that I knew Sebastian and I, 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 I like Sebastian. I've always liked Sebastian. I think he's a great front man, but I never thought like, dude, Sebastian's a big dude. Like I never thought about that part. <laughs> Sebastian picked this dude up, threw him on the freaking ground, held him down and was just saying something like, like, Oh, are you funny now? And it would smack him in the face. He goes, yeah, you happy now? And the guy tried and Sebastian was holding him down and just smacking him. And, and, I, and I'm sitting on the couch and Sebastian's doing it right in front of me and I'm walking. And I never thought Sebastian would be a badass ever in my life. And I was watching him just holding this guy down, like saying, oh, do you think you're funny now? Smack. Oh, do you think you're a funny guy now? Smack. And just sla and bitch slapping this dude. And I'm sitting right in front of him. And it was at that moment. And I got to bring that up to Sebastian because I don't even remember if he remembers that or not. <laughs> but just sitting there watching that, I mean, these are the things that just happened. My, and I, I mean, it's, 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 it was like this far from me. I'm sitting and I'm sitting on a couch and it's happening right in front of me. I'm like, that was awesome. <laughs> Who was the guy? You said I he was. I don't remember. I got to remember. He was some singer in some stupid band. I don't remember who it was, like some like rap metal band or something. <laughs> Tell me about wow. I, I have this name on my list because I'm a fan and you mentioned him earlier. And I don't know if, if I even want to go here, but um, I was going to ask you to tell me something about Tracy Guns, one no. of my guitar heroes. Last time I've known Tracy forever. Um, the last time I saw him, it wasn't a good thing. And we had words and uh, and, you know, he kept on saying, you know, I love you, Ricky, but this is business. And I love you, Ricky, but this is business. And, and me and Tracy and and. It's weird for me to say this because I love Tracy, but right now I don't love Tracy. I don't like him because he, the way he talked to me last time I saw him, I'm like, whatever, dude, you're a prick. So I, mm -hmm. and after that, I mean, it, it was ugly. The way he was talking to me was very, was very disrespectful. And he had his little manager there that was just being a little prick. And they were just both there sitting there. And I'm sitting there with Ace, who is like, if I made a list of my two best friends in the world, Ace Von Johnson's one of them. Yeah. And um, and uh, so the last time I saw Tracy wasn't good. And and I hold on to that. And that's now, you know, because of that, when I talk about the L.A. Rock scene, I don't really talk about L.A. Guns, which is a shame. You know why? Because L.A. Guns is a good band. Yeah. Like, yeah. L.A. Guns has got songs and their music is good and the band is tight. But the last time I saw Tracy, it was just like, dude, it's not all about business. It's really not all about business, you know? Yeah. So, and he told me it was, and I understand that now as, as musicians and we're all in our sixties or whatever, that now it's all about getting that mighty cash. But you know, the way he spoke with me with his manager was just like so lame. And I was just like, whatever. And well, so let's, uh, let's he's, not, that... he's not a part of my life. So when, so when somebody's like that, and if there ever was another big cat house, multimedia cat house extravaganza in Vegas, that was this multimedia thing that people walked in and saw these things going on and bands played. And there was a story of all that happened. L.A. Guns would not be a part of it. Wow. Um, but Man. if you really but if you guys really love each other, let's hope that in the future that, you know, him being easy to forget right now, hopefully he'll you guys will get get that figured out. We never talked on the phone. It wasn't like, hey, dude, what's yeah. up? It wasn't like that. Yeah. It wasn't like okay. it wasn't like the relationship I have with Slash. Right. You no, know? yeah. it wasn't like the relationship I have with Gilby Clark. Right. You know, Gilby Clark texts me, up, dude, I saw Pantera. It was awesome. You know, like Gilby Clark is somebody that I call family. Gilby Clark, I have been friends with forever. I love him, you know, like, like, a, like a brother. I've ridden motorcycles across country with Gilby. Nice. Um, Slash came to Charlotte. We had dinner not that long ago. Tracy is somebody that was never somebody that I hung out with. I've got a lot of history with him and he's a, he's a very, very talented musician. But the last time I saw him, I was just like, whatever. And, and, you know, think that they're this, what, it, it doesn't matter. It's somebody that doesn't exist in my world. And, and for, for me to say he, he was like a prick last time I saw him. It's like, okay, I don't care. I mean, I really just don't care. It's right. like a loss if I don't have Tracy guns in my life. Well, I hope that gets figured out. Let's do this. So you're in Charlotte, North Carolina right now? I'm in Mooresville, North Carolina. You're in Mooresville, North Carolina, and your tour starts where and when? My tour starts, and just so you know, Jason, every time I say this, I smile. You should. It's so bad. Those <laughs> of you guys. I mean, I who was it? I think it was Gilby that texted, you know, he's like, hey, now, you know, you, you have to. I'll tell you a story real quick, and then I'll tell you the dates. So... <laughs> And this, I think I'm going to mention in my show, the day after the notorious OD dying of Nikki six, um, he had about a couple people over at his house 
for Christmas. And it was me. This is the only people that were there. It was me, Fred Corey from Cinderella, Stephen Adler of Guns N' Roses, uh, Stephen Pierce, your rat, Nikki and me. No girls, just us. And we were sitting at Nikki's house. And I remember sitting there and um, everybody was talking about touring stories. And they were all talking about being on the road, this and that. And I was just sitting there going, that's the coolest thing in the world. That's the coolest. And little things like just waking up in the morning and having breakfast with your band or doing this or that. And I've always been jealous of hearing everybody. And you got to understand, that's what all my friends do. That's a, that's what you do. I'm sure after a while it gets boring, but I've never done any of this. So when I talk about it, just to say, you know, we have tour t-shirts. I got to design laminates. You know, this is the stuff that, that I'm so excited about. So the show starts Tuesday. Tuesday, I'll be in Cleveland at the Winchester Music Tavern. Wednesday, I'll be at the King of Clubs in Columbus. Have you ever been there? Um, no, but I've been recently seeing uh, live footage of, of bands playing there. Well, check this out. No. This is pretty weird. Um, so many times in my life, it's intertwined with Pantera things. Okay, so good. It turns out that December 8th, was the day that we lost dime four yeah. people were killed and that the club that I'm playing at is two miles from where that club was from the, the old Al, Al Rosa Villa. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're two miles from that club. Mm -hmm. So chances are, if you were a fan of damage plan, you might go to my spoken word. So there might be people at my show that were there that night. Oh yeah. On the December 8th show, you know, I do this crazy weird opening with stuff. On the December 8th show, I'm going to go out on stage early with no intro, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Pantera, mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk a little bit about how how precious life is and how, you know, what a loss it was for all of us, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to walk off stage, and then the intro is going to happen, and I'm going to do the show. So that's December 8th in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus. And then the next night, I bet you've played this club, The Machine Shop in Flint, Michigan. That sounds familiar. But it's, I don't have a memory of it. Well, I'm very familiar with that club because I keep on looking and it's like all these bands, all my friends' bands are playing there and the yeah. club looks badass and Michigan is cool. And I have so many friends and family that have, well, not family, family, but Cat House family that originally came from Michigan. So that's the Flint, Michigan. And then, then the next night, December 10th, I'm playing in Buffalo, New York which is a very small club called the rec room and the show's at six o'clock and that club, that's going to be an interesting show because it's an early show and it's a very small room. And then the next night, December 11th, I'm going to be in Sellersville, Pennsylvania, which is a very small town about half an hour outside of Philadelphia or Allentown. And it's a theater. It's a theater that does like plays and has like folk singers and, nice. and I'm looking at pictures of it. It was around in the 1800s. Beautiful. And like the lights and the seats and it's like this beautiful theater. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's just mind blowing. And I'm just looking at these. And my goal is that when I get back from these five shows that I go and do more. I mean, I want to play the Texas here in LA or I want to play. Obviously, I want to do a lot of shows in Texas because Texas has been Texas is so great with the exception of Lubbock. And um, <laughs> what is it about Lubbock? I just hate it. I just hate it. Every time I've ever been in Lubbock, just everything. You ride, you ride through there, huh? Yeah, I rode through there and I hated yeah. it. It was really hot. And I went to like a McDonald's and it was mean. <laughs> and uh, except the last time I was in Lubbock, I think I shot something because I do these cross country motorcycle rides. I did something yeah. about, you know, the whole Buddy Holly thing and that yeah. plane crash and Waylon Jennings being supposed to be on that plane and all that stuff. And um, so, but I guess I, last time I didn't have that bad of a time. But, <laughs> there um, you go. Love it. It'll come yeah. around. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any place to play anywhere, but I would love to do Dallas and Austin. You and should. There's this, there's this place in Eagle Pass, Texas. Yep. This little town. It's mostly, um, it's a Cougar. lot of Indians and a lot of Hispanic and um, they have Ricky Rackman Day there in October. Oh, is, it, is, it, is that a, is that Cooters? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Junkyard, junkyard plays. Junkyard when plays runs, there. When they do runs through Texas, they all I was there, play the Eagles. I was there when Junkyard played Cooters. That's right. You were. Yeah, yeah. I, I almost tagged along with them because uh, I'm a Junkyard fan, and I thought it'd be cool. I'd never been to that club, and I knew you were sort of hosting. Weren't you hosting the gig or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was, was it, you, uh, know, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you knew this. We're talking about the band that I was in, Battery Club. Mm-hmm. The first incarnation of Battery Club, Pat Mazinga was the drummer. Oh, okay. Of yeah. the first okay. incarnation of Battery yeah, Club. Okay. I well, like Junkyard. Junkyard's another band that um, it just it doesn't sound dated to me. Right. You know, right. Are just good rock and roll. Yeah, it's good oh, home yeah. cooking, fighting pub rock. Yeah. 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 And, and they're still putting out great music. Their last uh, record was really, really good. Yeah. Did so, you know that David lives next door to me right now? Like I could throw a rock and hit David Roach right now. I think you should do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, 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 came out, he came outside uh, i was i was actually putting up christmas lights on my house he came outside and took a picture of me up on a ladder and put it on facebook <laughs> he's, he's that's a, there's like there's bands out there that are just fun yeah you know? Yeah, oh, junkyard is definitely fine. Junkyard is go, fun. Go see them and not have a good time. Ricky, it was yeah. awesome hanging with you and talking to you today. Definitely, it was so much fun. Uh, yeah, yeah man. you're you're one of the good ones, and you know I don't I could really give a shit what people's opinion of you are because you're because you're easygoing and kind of a a chameleon of sorts. It's just the way. Uh, you know, you need to adapt or die and uh, you, you wear it well and it's cohesive somehow. You know, it's not like you're putting on a suit and then putting on a cat house shirt. It's constant. I had to do that when I was a car salesman. Of course you did. Of yeah. course you did. But it's I'm so sure that- it's like people, people, you know, people got so mad when I cut my hair in 1992, so mad. And then <laughs> in three years ago, I was, my hair, three years ago, my hair was back down to the way it was. My hair was that long ago, three years ago. And it, and it was like, oh, yeah, you got grew your hair back. And I was like, yeah. And when everybody starts saying grow your hair back, I start with the mohawk, which everybody said was a bad idea. And I've been rocking my mohawk for a couple of years now. No, no, about a year and a half. And I love it. I'm 60 years old and I have a mohawk. How rad is that? No, <laughs> keep going, still- man. Just I keep, love it. Just keep on being Ricky Rackman, man. Absolutely. You're 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 a good dude, and uh, we appreciate right. you. Yeah, I man. Have- we we wish you all the luck in the world with your uh, one foot in the gutter tour. Folks can uh, buy tickets uh, again. Tell us the website, Ricky. Well, cathousehollywood.com is a good place because if you go to cathousehollywood.com, it's got the links to all the different venues. Perfect. So when if when we play Texas, rather than just saying all the places in Texas that we're going to play, this is hopefully talk about the future. Um, if you just go to cathousehollywood.com, it's got links to all. I'm not selling the tickets per se, but you can get the links from cathousehollywood.com. Perfect. Yeah, click Good. on the venue that you want to see, that they want to see you out. They buy the tickets through the venue. Excellent. Thanks yeah. again, Ricky. Thanks, Ricky, thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, along with our special guest today, Ricky Rackman on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs>